do this uh, research and action special <laughs> session on decals, as it was just shown here. Um, my name is Nina Troy, as you can see on this wonderful little chart over here. <laughs> and um, I work at the Concept Back Neue Ökonomie in Leipzig. Um, we've been one, of, been one of the main organizers of the last degrowth conferences. I say that because this inspired this project. And I have three wonderful speakers with me who also participated in the project Degrowth Movements. This is Emmy Salza from Via Campesina Austria. Um, Ashish Kutari from Calva Frick, who um, contributed something on radical ecological democracy, and Silke Helfrich, who works on comments. And I was thinking about presenting them a little more, but then I realized it's not that important for our session. And you've seen Ashish a couple of times already. <laughs> And Silke intervenes in almost every session saying something on comments, so she works on comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we start, I would like to thank our friends from Ecapio who will film this session. Um, they brought me a little flyer and um, the email, the internet address. You can find the video online on ecapio.org afterwards. And if ever you have questions and you don't want the question to be taken, we can cut it out afterwards, but you won't be filmed anyways. Probably the question is going to be from the off. Yeah. Um, so before we have the three presenters <coughs> telling us about degrowth and um, and uh, their related movement, I would like to give a short introduction on what this project is about, so you know why why we're coming home. <coughs> so the idea of the project degrowth movements is that, as you all know probably, that degrowth is not only an academic debate but also an emerging social movement and. We are wondering what this movement is all about. And in Leipzig, there were over 3,000 people attending the degrowth conference. And um, we made a survey, maybe some of you have been to a workshop this morning about it, where we asked the participants, like, what kind of social movements do you identify with? And they named a lot of social movements, for anything you can imagine. I think, actually, um, like, over 150 or something like that. And there were a lot of workshops and sessions present from people from different strands of other social movements. And so we realized in those workshops and also obviously doing other, uh, doing other things that there's a lot of similarities um, and a lot of things in common, but there are also a lot of divergencies. But above all, there's a lack of knowledge. We have the feeling that there is um, a very often a very superficial um, thing we know about others. So maybe you can already tell me a phrase about comments, but you don't really know it. And then there's a lot of um, skepticisms and also a lot of prejudices. So the environment movements, ah, they don't think of social issues, and the socialist, the social <coughs> activists, they always forget the environment part, all those things. So we thought there would be a very good space for mutual learning. And that's why the, how the idea of degrowth movements came up. And basically, um, the project is um, a multimedia publication where we invited representatives from 32 social movements to reflect about their movement and also to their relation to degrowth. Um, it was a joint reflection and writing process. This was accompanied by um, two, well, one for now, but two will follow workshops where the authors actually had a debate. Um, we debated with them about the articles. There was a large part of editing. So it's not only one text about 25,000 signs, which is contributed, but also a process around it. And those texts are now published in a multimedia publication with photos, videos, and podcasts on degrowth.de. This is the German degrowth web portal where we have a lot of issues around degrowth. They actually have some flyers over there. I want to take one in the end. <coughs> and since it was a German initiative project, project, and obviously in a conference in Germany, also most of the people were there German. It's um, so far it's complete in German, so we have all 32 texts in German. But we also have five in English and one in Spanish. And we will have more in, in English to follow. It's just not online yet. And we will also um, publish this in a book in 2017. Um, I listed all the movements because maybe it's a good, a, a good interest, um, good thing to get an impression who's there. I couldn't fix the naming, so you can count 16 plus 16 makes 32. I give you a second to look at it. <laughs> <coughs> PGA. People's Global Action, sorry. 
Yeah, it's um, so from globalization critics, we have two movements: one is the global north attack, and then Tibet's local action was the equip equipment. This a globalization critique movement from the global south. And unions, which kind of? Um, that's interesting. It's um, someone from Verdi, from the German um, service, service sector. Service Thank you very much. And someone studying on that. So it was Norbert Reuter who contributed. Yeah. Artivism. <laughs> Artivism. Okay. So maybe that's an interesting point as well. Um, I call it movements for now in German. We say it's movement alternative economies and initiatives. So I'll we'll keep it short for the presentation. And activism is an initiative that works on a critical reflection from a better artistic side on Negro. It's actually one of the texts in English. I'll come to that in a second. Um, I would also like to share the questions with you so you know what it's all about. The texts have five sections. The first is what is the idea, the key idea of the social movements, what's the narrative of change, what are, the current, what are the critiques of the current system? The second is who is part of the movement? Who are its protagonists? What do they do and why do they do it? The third is how do you see the relationship between this movement and degrowth? And how do you see the relationship to other movements? So for example, if it was not only relating to degrowth, but also other movements around, or other movements in the publication, often what about that? And then we ask for um, proposals um, that have the movement had for the Negro's perspective, but also what they thought they could learn from the Negro's perspective. Um, and the last question was a space for visioning, a suggestion, and, vis and wishes um, on how we could move on as movements. And I would like to give you um, a short impression of what it looks like. So this is the main website. Um, I put the German version now because it's complete. So you can see all the movements here and the introduction. And then from here, you can go to the different um, movements. Yeah. Um, I'll switch to English so we can have a look at the text. Of so I can click here where you can democracy. And you can find the text of Ashish. We also did a podcast with Ashish, which is half German, half English. but. If you only speak English, you have a lot to wait for a while than it's English. <laughs> 42 seconds. Half German is not me. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then you can see that here's the overview of the questions. And then if you click into one question, you can see the answer and there's all the pictures. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to do it too, too PR-like, but I want to have you have an idea. And also, this is a good um, moment to thank Corinna. This is my colleague Corinna, who runs the project with me and another colleague, and she does the whole online thing, does all co work. <laughs> but not all. No, but no. Even a little more. Yeah. That's as the basic presentation of the project. I don't know if it's very interesting to give me technical questions now, but if you have one you think is very important to ask before we get into the content based questions, please feel free to ask. Translating all the German ones? No. English. Actually, we don't have money for that right now. Um, we are translating like up to eight for now, and we have to see if we find money for translating more. Yeah, well, there's probably something interesting to add, right? This is always subjective, so I bet you could have found 10 other people who could have like, gotten as good as a text. We mostly contact the people we know, so, and it depends also on the inner democracy of the movement, if they spread it around or not. So sometimes people said, well, yeah, I'm gonna do it because I don't even know whom to ask for. Or sometimes they said, oh, I'm gonna discuss it with my group, and they found some other, someone else who edited it. So for like example, we did. We have, we have, for instance, we have a kind of speakers list in the Commons circles in Germany, and so I usually get the invitations and then kind of share them, and people self-select, so to say. And this will. Yeah. Hold on, I have another question. I'm not sure if it's, it's the right place to ask it, but since you listed the, the movements there, or some of them, uh, is the environmental justice movement in your list as well? Well, I think the environmental justice movement is there with a lot of issues, so with two environmental <coughs> movements and climate justice, but there's not one with 
where we asked a group which uh, just says, okay, we identify only as climate justice, uh, only as environmental justice. Okay. I'm asking for, um, because of this uh, supposed tension between the two that was uh, put forward yesterday in the plenary. Yeah. It's maybe an interesting discourse. It's, I think in Germany, you either refer to special specific movements, for example, we asked Ashish, right, which is on environmental justice, or you refer to climate justice in, in the German discourse yeah. rather than to environmental justice. So that's, I think, the framing. But the content is there. Mm -hmm. yeah? Well, I don't know if you will cover in the next uh, part of the presentation, but I'm looking, what, what is the scope uh, on top of the advertising that we have a common single place where all the movements uh, can be uh, stood and they can give the presentations. What are you doing together? Yeah, I think that's a good question to have after the presentations. Okay. But it's an important question. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, well, um, I would then like to pass the word to Emmy. I learned today that she does not only work for Via Campesina as a lobbyist, <laughs> um, but also that she has a farm which was almost burned down now, so she had a very heavy summer, and I thank you especially for coming here for one day to share with us. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Nina, so everyone knows. Uh, we had some, yeah, we had a little fire on our place, so I was busy with a lot of things this summer not only uh, growing my tomatoes and putting them into cans uh, and uh, taking care of my animals, but also trying to take away all the burnt stuff and uh, trying to do some political uh, and activist work as well. Uh, I'm Irmi, an organic farmer with my family in the eastern part of Austria. It's a small farm. It's, uh, the, the scope of the farm is more or less the, uh, like the most common scope of uh, size of farms in the world. We have about two hectares. 85% of the farms in this world are around or less than two hectares. Uh, in the Austrian context, a really tiny farm. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we don't live from it uh, exclusively, but we, we do other things as well. And I work as a lobbyist, as I always like to say, for small farmers, for peasant farmers. In Via Campesina, I've been working there for 10 years now. I'm a lobbyist for the interests of small and peasant farmers and I do some press work and uh, we have a newspaper and so on and I go to the Chamber of Agriculture and to the Ministry and to Brussels and so on lobby for the interests of the small farmers. But before I start to talk about food sorry, about our framework, our political framework, uh, I would like to ask who does not know what, we are, what or who Via Campesina is? Okay. A few people, so I will start with a brief explanation about Via Campesina. We consider ourselves the biggest social movement in the world. So we are always, in our little food sovereignty bubble, we always, we are a little bit impressed if someone does not know what Via Campesina is. <laughs> I think like this is, uh, everyone in the world has to know. So, uh, as I said, we, are, we consider ourselves the biggest social movement in the world. We have about 150 million of members. Uh, in more than 70 uh, countries, uh, and it's all of this, it's a network, we are not an NGO, we are a network of peasant farmers organizations, of indigenous people's organizations, of landless workers organizations. One of the biggest movements uh, in our network is, for example, MSFD in, in Brazil, uh, we, and we, we, we don't exactly know how many members we have because uh, of course, in countries in the global south, not every organization has a register with all the names, but it's movements, it's people uh, struggling for, uh, for food sovereignty. And in food sovereignty, very often I come across the term food sovereignty in, in some context and I get a little uh, nervous because I think oh, people don't understand what we mean with, with food sovereignty. Because very often people think food sovereignty is autarky. You have uh, sufficient food uh, uh, subs subsistence, for example. You have, you, are so, uh, you have enough food for your uh, community, for your people, for your country, for your region, and this is food sovereignty. And for us in Via Campesina, being a global movement, food sovereignty is something totally different. It, uh, food sovereignty has some notions of, uh, of course, it, it concentrates on local control, on local uh, economies and so on, and also, of course, on having enough sufficient food for 
uh, people in a certain territory. But this is not the most uh, important thing. The term sovereignty, uh, it, it, it comes from uh, the, the beginning of the 90s and it, it was chosen explicitly because in, uh, during, at the beginning of the 90s, um, global institutions started to become uh, more and more powerful in the, in, the notion, in the context of global food policies, politics in food and agricultural systems. The World Bank, Bank, the IMF, and so on, G20, G8, other organizations, multinational corporations. So global, uh, food policies fo uh, and, and food systems became increasingly uh, globalized and the control, the power about uh, about these, uh, about local and, and, and global food systems uh, were increasingly uh, centralized in, in, in the hierarchy. So people's move, movements, especially in Latin America, they said we need to regain, we need to, uh, our sovereignty about food policies. And this is, the, this is the reason why we call it food sovereignty, because uh, we struggle, we fight for <coughs> people's right to define their own food systems their own policies and the right to control, the, to regain the right to control these these systems. So this is one of the the core issues of of, of food sovereignty. And this was when we started to work on our text. Uh, I wrote it together with a colleague in Austria, uh, and we also tried to share it in our Austrian uh, food sovereignty movement with other people and uh, got some feedback. And, and we are talking about it. And this this was one of the things we we started to think: what is the difference, for example, with uh, other movements uh, and what we have in common and I think this was one of the learnings for us uh, to, to uh, try to s systematize these, these, uh, these thoughts and this and this uh, and to think about it because uh, very often you in your daily struggle you, you you take it for granted what is your concept what's, what is your framework what do you fight for and you don't you don't uh, try to theorize to, to, to yeah, to engage in theory about it. So uh, we we thought that in, with many of these movements and also with the degrowth movement, we have some things in common, like uh, that we we focus on collectives instead of individuals. Uh, we we uh, focus on on local control, local initiatives in the global context. Uh, we. Uh, Many of these movements want to have a social ecological transformation, so we take uh, the social and the ecological uh, are as important, both, both uh, struggles are uh, equally important. But there all, we also found out there's, we think there are some differences. Uh, the global food sovereignty movement uh, really tries to uh, or puts in, in the center of, we, we put in, in the center of attention uh, the struggle against uh, the domination of the people in the food system. Of course, we are sexual movement. We fight for food sovereignty and not for housing sovereignty or for uh, education and so on. So we fight for the right to have food. But in order to to to, uh, to be able to be uh, to to have these these so-called social and economical and cultural rights in the I don't know if some of you know these terms. Uh, in German, it's BSK, what is it in Spanish? Uh, <coughs> Communication? No, no. The, uh, uh, Spanish, it's desk. In English, it's. Uh, it's the. Social Cultural Rights? Yeah. ESC rights, no? Yes. Uh, these, yeah. these rights, uh, yeah, thanks. In, in order to, to be able to, to, to have these rights, the right to food, the right to education, the right to housing, and so on, we struggle for the right to have rights. Uh, so th this is. Uh, we, we, so this in, the, in the core of food sovereignty is the democratization of our society uh, in our sexual approach, of course. Uh, since I have only one, one minute left, I want to, to focus now, and I think we can discuss afterwards, but I want to focus on, 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 on the last part of, of, of our exercise, so what is our wishes, our visions for the future, and there was the question, in order to have an emancipatory movement, uh, movement, what can we do in order to, uh, to uh, achieve social ecological change? And we discussed it a lot in Austria in our food sovereignty movement. That we, we are convinced that uh, we don't need one movement, one single 
emancipatory movement, but we need to, to focus on the, on the complementarity of the movements, which, are, uh, which struggle in solidarity with each other, which try to, uh, to make links, to, to exchange experiences, to ex exchange strategies, to exchange uh, knowledge, to exchange, uh, yeah, a lot. But we need to, uh, to fight our own struggles. Every movement has to fight its own struggles. And this is, this is our, uh, we are convinced about this, and I'm happy to discuss with you afterwards. Thank you very much. How many people were at the plenary today on here? Maybe the other way around. Who hasn't heard yeah, Ashish this morning? Ah, Who hasn't heard Ashish at, at all, all for now? <laughs> Not too many. So uh, maybe just reiterate a couple of things and rather than do a full presentation. Um, the well if you look at the situation in, in, in South Asia and primarily India from where I have the experience. Uh, we have uh, a whole range of, of movements, um, there's not one movement, a whole range of movements which are either resistance movements against the dominant uh, forms of development and, and government, political governance and so on, and also a whole range of movements which are about reconstruction, about creating alternative uh, ways of uh, well-being, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's uh, in some places we actually call it Sangharsh and Nirvan, which is like resistance and reconstruction, or resistance and alternatives. Uh, and from uh, a process that we've been doing in the last few years, which uh, is called Vikalp Sangam, which is like building uh, alternatives confluences, uh, trying to actually envision uh, what it means to come together and what, what is a uh, common vision that's emerging. Uh, so it's from, on, on the basis of that process that we've actually, uh, the, the concept radical ecological democracy is not really part of that process. It's a label that some of us use, but I don't think we should worry about labels. That's one important message I want to give here also. Uh, but the principles that we're actually trying to evolve through this process is the, the five circle thing that I presented this morning, uh, like the Olympics, which is uh, five interrelated uh, overlapping circles, uh, which is deep, uh, deep democracy or radical democracy, political democracy, which is really about decision making at the level at which decision making should be happening, which is all of us rather than leaving it to the state or corporations or bureaucrats and so on. Uh, the second is economic democracy, so similar to what Jimmy was also talking about, where the means of production are in the hands of the producers, uh, and you're, you're actually localizing as far as possible uh, production processes, you know, especially for, for basic needs. Um, and uh, you know, where uh, uh, in, in the process of economic exchange, uh, uh, social processes of exchange and production and reproduction, uh, non-monetary processes of exchange, local currency processes of exchange are actually prioritized over what we right now have, which is a globalized market uh, economic system. Uh, the third is, uh, so is social justice, very important obviously because we do have inequalities of all kinds in the world and uh, whether the traditional inequalities of gender and, and, uh, and caste, so on in India, caste is very important. Or the new ones of wealth, as we see now, one percent of the world, one percent of the population having more money than ninety-nine percent. Uh, so, if you look at that, then the creation of social justice, which is really about uh, genders and class and age and and, and uh, ethnicities and race and, and so on, that's the third third sort of circle. Uh, the fourth one is um, ecology. Uh, this is not in any order of priority, by the way. They're all equally important as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the fifth, the fourth is ecology, or ecological resilience, ecological wisdom, working within nature, understanding that one is part of nature and not separate from it, respecting other species, respecting the rights of nature, uh, and understanding limits and so on. And the fifth, uh, and, and something that actually doesn't get discussed adequately, I think, is cultural and knowledge diversity, uh, which is really about uh, acknowledging 
and looking at and understanding the strengths of diversity, whether it's the diversity of languages, of cuisines, of uh, ways of dressing, of uh, ideologies, of you know, all kinds of different cultural language things, and, 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 and knowledge also, knowledges, so that we're not prioritizing modern science and technology over everything else, uh, but there are different ways of, of knowing and being. Uh, so it's really these five circles intersecting and uh, talking about then, uh, if you look at those five circles kind of floating up there somewhere, there's also a foundation which is what we're talking about, which is a foundation of values. And that's where I think that the movements can actually work together much more. So solidarity, okay? uh, collectives, diversity, compassion, uh, sharing, caring, um, so if you look at it, I mean, I put them up this morning on my, in my presentation, but a set of maybe 10, 15, 20 values and principles, and you can keep expanding them, and they'll be expressed in different ways in different parts of the country, of the world. Uh, but this this foundation of ethical values, which, which is really the base uh, of all human relationships and of human relationships with the rest of nature, is to how do you bring that ethical base back into our movements, as opposed to the kind of individualization, selfishness, you know the selfie culture, which uh, which is uh, you know which is kind of dominant all over the world. Uh, so, in terms of similarities and differences, <clears throat> I think in terms of what we're against, degrowth, uh, Swaraj from our context. Did I explain Swaraj? Sorry, no. I did in the morning. I forgot that. Okay, so just to quickly give you the concept of that, this, the Swaraj, Swaraj is a concept that was popularized by Gandhi in the independence struggle, but uh, it's not necessarily only about independence of India from the colonial powers. It's really about individual to community freedoms which come with the responsibility of other individuals and community freedoms, of respecting others, others' freedoms also, which means that you, I can't, it's not about I'm going to drive my car the way I want, or I will own an uh, own a big SUV. It doesn't matter what happens to everybody else. That's not the freedom we're talking about. Swaraj is really about freedom, rights, and responsibilities, of, and also about the ability to go deep within oneself uh, in a spiritual uh, way, and therefore also then relate with compassion and so on with other people. So. Uh, 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 in, in the sense that, that Swaraj or radical ecological democracy is against uh, capitalism and state domination and patriarchy and so on, uh, the concentrations of power, I think there's a lot of similarity with, with all of our movements. You know, it's all, I'm sure Bill Weaver has the same kind of struggles with uh, global and, and national forces, structural forces. Um, in the sense that we also believe in some certain values together, the collectivities, the solidarities, the uh, localization, uh, and so on, I think there's a great deal of similarity, though they might be expressed in different ways in different parts of the world. Where I think there might be differences, and this is worth looking at, is the movements that are emerging in countries like India or possibly also Southern uh, South America are emerging from spaces of survival, uh, which is probably very different from what you have in Europe and, and North America. Basic survival, just being able to live uh, with, with dignity and, and, uh, and have a secure livelihood is the struggle when one is talking about anti-growth, anti-development, anti-capitalist kind of thing. You know, it's, it's a day-to-day -day life kind of survival also. It's a, that's one, one thing which maybe is different. And, it, and if you look at it like that, then maybe the way it's expressed also becomes very different. The second one I would say is that, um, is that for, for hundreds of millions of people in, this, in the South, the global South, uh, there is either new forms of deprivation or old forms of deprivation that have continued. And I mean deprivation from basic needs. Not enough food, not enough good quality water, not sources of learning or, or uh, good health and, and so on. So it's really about the struggle to also create alternative ways of raising the well-being of people. This is not growth. I'm not talking about economic growth. I'm simply saying of creating situations where deprivations are removed and people have dignified, uh, prosperous in a nice sense, not financial, uh, you know, ways of life. Okay, so uh, yeah, just to finish with that, I think therefore, uh, 
uh, you know, in terms of terminologies and so on, and this is not just terminology issue, it's also about understanding basic uh, different epistemologies, different ways of cognition, different ways of knowledge, as I was saying. Something like, I'm finishing, uh, something like degrowth, uh, uh, even as a concept, is not going to work in situations like that. What works is, is well being, what works is survivals of dignity, uh, struggles of dignity, stuff, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think it's that. We need to find common languages which actually cut across this diversity of terms and respect the diversity, which is exactly what also uh, Irmi was, was saying. And the convergence, therefore, needs to happen on the struggles against the global forces. And we have to converge on that, wherever our movements are, and on the level of values, of ethical values. I think that's where convergence takes place. Beyond that, not just respect, I think we should celebrate the diversity and the differences that we have in different movements. Thank you. my talks look like. And this one will be a little bit conceptual, so I start with an anecdote. Um, I, I've been living in, in Latin America for quite a while, for eight years, and we did a huge international conference on the topic on the commons in 2006. And we invited a lot of folks from, you know, those who are dealing with the erosion of uh, biodiversity and, and land and water and all these kind of um, essential things uh, uh, for a dignified life. Uh, but we also invited somebody from the um, free software movement in Argentina. And she was kind of meeting a guy from Argentina at the airport, and they met each other for the first time, and, and they got in touch, and they discovered that they would go to the same conference. And she wondered, well, why is that? What, am, what the hell am I doing there? At a conference of green people, peasants, and so on. And then she was listening to them, and her turn was the third day at the very end of the conference, and she, she uh, started talking, and her first, first question was, for whom does your computer work? And then it never asked me that question. And then I, I, I discovered that all the institutions, et cetera, et cetera, rely on proprietarian tools, which is like, depending on who produces the tractor so that you can have food sovereignty. And I started to discover the commons as something that links very different communities and cultures together. So for me, it is not really, it is not really a movement, um, but a concept. I was asked to do a very short introduction into the commons, talk quickly about the specificities of this approach, and then kind of look at the common pillars for convergence. I call it the commons as a uh, a, a big C at the beginning, and here is a small C, and that is not a coincidence. Right? So, if you look at the Commons literature, you will find, even in my books, or the, the, the things we do, you'll find very different notions of the Commons, very different uh, um, framings. The most, perhaps most popular one, but if, you, if I would ask you, what is the Commons for you, what would you say? Um, a way of sharing resources. Okay, you would kind of be at the second level focus on processes. Many people, and in the commons literature, also in the academic literature, you find first place centered on resources. Certain type of resources should be managed and held in common instead of privately owned or um, managed uh, by the state. So we have a, a huge amount of literature on the first focus, but as you say, and I share as well, uh, focusing the commons uh, discourse on processes as if commons were complex socio-ecosystems to be constantly reproduced through what we call commoning. And I very much share this approach because I, I, I uh, was a bit surprised that in this Degrowth conference, I don't know 
if this has been the same case in Venice and in Leipzig, but I heard very frequently that degrowth is also a set of social practices. So I really wonder, what is your word for this? Or, more precisely, what is your verb for this? So if you focus on an alternative as alternative social practices, and we heard from Barbara Muraka that gaining a habit in alternative social practices is maybe the most powerful institution to change the world. So, common is very important. Uh, at the next level, which is also a very strong body of literature, coming from very different cultures, uh, focus on production. Uh, I, uh, something that I would call, well, we are talking about, we are trying to figure out what would an oil economy look like? What would a, not only common space peer production look like, because at the end, every kind of production is commons-based, extracting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from socio-ecological systems. But what, what a commons-oriented, a commons-recreating, a commons-creating peer production look like? So we have a huge um, uh, focus on uh, looking at the productive and generated, generating processes, uh, producing value and things, things we need to make a living. And the last one, which I think is very, very important, and this will be my last point in the presentation as well, it is very important to this convergence project, is focusing on commons as a paradigm shift. Kind of seeing commons and commoning as a worldview, as one of the many expressions which are based on, on a, this word's important, on a relational ontology on a relational ontology and therefore also a different epistemology and reflexology. What does that just mean? Oh no. <laughs> um, yes, yes. <laughs> what does that mean? That it is not about are the individual or the collective. It is not either or. It is my unfolding cannot be on the expense, as you said this morning, Ashish, of the others. My unfolding goes through you. You cannot even think about I if there is no you. You cannot think about collective if there is no I. So it is not I versus collective. And this is part of the strength of the paradigm shift. My second point. What are the specificities in a commons approach? So I, I call it five powerful features of commons, very quickly. First of all, and this is what I think makes the commons really, really, really powerful, you find them literally everywhere. I mean, this morning, you just made the presentations of the historical and the modern commons in, in India, right? Uh, they are and have always been everywhere, and so there is a certain universality in this approach, which is very important to me as I'm doing international work. Second, the notion of the commons contains its own subject. Commons, community, Almende, in German, it's the same thing. You, you have already that notion of the, the something kind of community is the subject of the commons. So not the isolated I or the homo economicus. But today, what do we mean, we, what do we mean when we say community? We mean, we mean oh, there's a, there's, this is an error. It is not only more than one, it's more than two. So we have very different notions of community. They can be global today. They, they can be peer-to-peer -peer network. Perhaps the only common feature of the different subjects of the commons is that they are more than two. Ah, and, and this is another point of the commons approach. So the commons <coughs> doesn't belong to anybody or what belongs to everybody. It is, we have a huge diversity of co-possession regimes in the commons. So it is not no property, it is different regimes of collectively assessing, sharing, and using, and recreating resources. So we have a huge legal diversity there. The third point, and I, I already mentioned it, if you look at the commons as generative practices, you can see, and in a way, Irmi, I, I, would, I would point to your notion of sovereignty. I was thinking about framing the commons as an omni-sovereignty approach. In a way. 
because we basically rely on the same ideas and struggles and resistances and constructive uh, struggles as you do, gaining sovereignty over the means of production and policies of production in whatever realm. That is also why you can find, can find the comments pretty much everywhere. And the last, no, the fourth, next one will be the last, um, point is, um, it connects back to my anecdote from the beginning. I guess this is one of the few movements that truly try to connect all realms of social life. That is, we have a very strong debate, including the digital one. That is, we have a very strong debate, for instance, about what some people call digital commons. I don't like it because I think commons are always social. And they are have always they have always uh, they are always based on natural resources. Also, the hackers need food, so to say. <laughs> um, but what is important, if you look at the level of production, of how to really think about a new economy, it is not only about commoning land, commoning care, commoning water. It's also about commoning technologies and infrastructures. So please stop using Microsoft, Apple, and this kind of stuff. Yep, I will finish <laughs> my fifth point. And the last one is, so if we imagine and try to enact a common society, a common reproducing society, I, I like to call it a three-in-one approach, and it, it is very much, the third element is, is very close to this variety concept you just explained. So you remember that difficulty we usually have in common lefty approach, which are kind of very much focused on justice and fairness. And then we have a difficulty to combine this with the ecological dimension. And it's even more difficult to connect it to the notion of freedom, which comes from the liberal tradition. So what I find so useful in common approach is that three in one perspective. It is about free, fair, and sustainable, sustainable society. So in other words, and this is my last idea, <laughs> I want to second what Ashish said. <laughs> there is a paradigm shift going on. It is not enough to discuss. If you want to build a new house, for instance, and you have a room here and a room there and a room there, and what we are now doing in a convergence project is we are trying, trying to do this and connect these rooms. That's extremely useful and nice. But if you want to build these new common house, say, a free, fair, and sustainable society, I really don't care for the name. A free, let's call it a free, fair, and sustainable society. The most powerful thing to do is to look at the pillars we are standing upon. In other ways, what are the assumptions we are standing upon? And in order to do this, you need to step aside and look down there and wonder, in my everyday struggle, in my political struggle, in my concepts, do I have that uh, notion as the homo economico? Mm -hmm. Or is there another, I don't know, um, self in context? Let's put it that way, a social self in context. <coughs> do I reassess the relation between nature and uh, that culture? Do I think about production as a linear process and do I use binary concepts? So what are the basic assumptions? What is the, and, and, and very much if you look at the metaphors, you can find out if people use a kind of binary, dualistic, mechanical concept or basic assumptions they are standing upon or different ones. And what, what I can even hear you speaking is we are basically standing upon the same pillars. And this is what enables a strong connection at this level. And if we fight at this worldview, that's what you call worldview, I would say, I don't like so much the word values. And you know why? Because it's so, it, it's so heavily, it, it, it is so easy to um, connect this with a moralistic touch, so to say. So I, I like to call this the basic assumption. So let us connect at the level of the basic assumptions. Thank you very much, Silke. Um, <clears throat> since it was like three presentations who are supposed to be linked to each other, but now they spoke after one another that before I give the word to you, 
I would like to give each of the speakers two minutes, thank you, maybe 30 seconds, <laughs> to react on what you said, like what did this inspire from you, what you heard from the two other speakers. Yeah, so. Okay, uh, I just want to add two small things. I, um, I, I, I agree with you, I also noted on values um, with the question mark, but I think this is also uh, maybe different in, in our in European context compared to a, a context in India or in other countries from the global south. The same with cultural diversity, which makes me a little bit shiver because in, in, in our European context, the, the notion of cultural diversity very often comes with right wing uh, discourses. So you have to be a little careful using the, uh, these terms. Uh, but but I, I, I know that it is uh, different in, in a global perspective. Uh, and I, I wanted to add one more thing, because you said in the Global South, it's a, the, the movements, they, they, they emerge from spaces of, of struggle for survival. And in Via Campesina, we always emphasize the, the fact that we, we believe very often people think food sovereignty is a concept for the Global South. It's nothing to do with the Global North, we can support it and so on. Uh, and very often it's, uh, we have this north-south discourse. And in Via Campesina, we, we, uh, we em emphasize the, the <coughs> we, we think that it's, it's not a battle between different, the north and the south, it's a battle between modes of production and, and modes of consumption and modes of uh, distribution and which is, uh, and we have this bat battle in Austria, we have it in Europe, we have it in India, we have it in the United States, we have it, we have it everywhere. And also, for example, the peasant farmers in Europe, they are fighting for survival. Not the physical survival in terms of they, they uh, lack food, but they fight to, uh, to exist as a mode of production. Because we have the, the agro-industrial complex eating us up and with TTIP and CETA and all these uh, free trade agreements coming on forth, it, it's accelerating. So I would pref prefer to, to, um, yeah, to, to, to see the differences, but to, to, also, uh, to focus on what we have in common in our struggles. Thank you. <coughs> Ashish. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd agree. I think this is something that, maybe it's also a language uh, issue. Uh, Maybe this is why we use global south and south and global north rather than south and north. Because yeah, the the, pres the people struggling, you know, in the, the Sami population struggling in Finland and Iceland and uh, Norway and so on, is in that sense part of the global south. So I think that that's what I meant by the struggle. <coughs> the struggle for survival is in that sense a little bit different, maybe very different from let's say an environmental movement or a degrowth movement that is coming from. Uh, a community that's not struggling for survival, but has seen that something <coughs> is going terribly wrong. If you remember, the, those of you who were there in the morning, that image of the, you know, the evolution of human beings from ape to computers, uh, is that maybe, so that's a different motivation coming there, the deadening of, of jobs and, li and lifestyles and so on, against which there is, a, and that's equally legitimate and important, but it's a different, uh, it's not that you're going to starve tomorrow if one is not doing. Uh, so I think that's what I meant. Uh, and it wasn't so much a geographical thing. So I agree with you totally that it's actually struggles of modes of production, so uh, consumption and, and distribution. Um, yeah, I think on this values thing, maybe uh, maybe I'll come back on that later. But yeah, it's, it's uh, I say ethics, and to me, ethics and values is not really about moralizing. It's about I mean, we all live, whether we like it or not, we all do things on the basis of an understanding of what we think is right or wrong. Which is not the same thing as saying to somebody else that you are right or wrong. But we ourselves, when we seek to do something, it's based on a certain set of, uh, what I think are fundamental ethics, really. Um, you know, and so, uh, I think that's, that's common. When we call it assumptions or ethics or values, it's not. Again, less labels is not so important. So anyway, these are a couple of reactions. I might have more things to say later on. But I'm so much in agreement with everything else that <laughs> I agree. <laughs> 30 seconds? Was I so long? Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, 
okay, quickly, two points. If I said, if I said, um, I don't care about the wording, that, then I need to wonder why I stick to the wording for 14 years now, to the comments. Yeah, right. Well, the answer is simple, it is so useful. The, the second thing I wanted to clarify is, because this has become kind of very heavy, conceptually speaking, and I just want to give you an example. My, my sentence is basically, I have more in common with the degrower based on the same assumptions than with the commoner based on different assumptions. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by assumptions? Very quickly, what is a paradigm shift? It is, it is trying to speak with the mindset, thinking that the world is round to somebody who really, really, really believes that the world is flat. It just doesn't work. So and when we talk to each other like this, and I hear you talking, I hear Victor talking, I hear Barbara talking, they, to me they are commoners. Just one second, this is the perfect moment. The next step what we're doing is, I want, would like you to share with your neighbor you're sitting next to, what is inspired for you so far. So two minutes of a whispering round while you collect more glasses, if you do. <laughs> yeah, just, so please share with, you, with each other.
conceptual point of view, uh, to learn more and to get a bit deeper like on the ground in terms of concepts and social practices. Mm -hmm. Andreas? Yeah. Someone around, you may raise the hand. Okay, yeah. Uh, my name is Julio, and I am um, a PhD, and I also was a part of the founding of a time bank. And uh, our problem in the time bank, uh, our time bank association, if uh, anybody knows what it, it, it looks like, what it is time bank, it was that we didn't have any acknowledgement by citizens of the of PISA, in the city of Washington. Uh, because we didn't, did not have any um, public acknowledgement by, say, you know, municipalities or any other kind of public institution, like uh, markets, uh, public spaces or market halls, and uh, they were not recognizing us. So do you think that uh, networking between among different associations uh, may also help to bring one another up the stairs to public movement from uh, other citizens that might be skeptical of the meaning of this kind of approach. Since they were all pretty big, maybe stay with us four now. And very next round, you're also very welcome to comment on those questions if you want to. So who wants to start? Yeah, I, I, can, I can take that specific question first. Well, I was already doing this when I was talking about digital commons, right? Because for me, uh, first of all, there's no such thing as a digital commons or an urban commons or this commons or that commons. It's basically each commons is based on natural resources, each commons is a knowledge commons, and each commons is a social process. And what is very useful from Rifkin's, who is kind of picking up what's hot, right? And then making a book out of it and making and converting it into a bestseller, that he's very good at this. <laughs> um, what is very useful in his approach is that he can show that um, the conditions for production have changed at the le at energy level and at the level of um, information and communication technology. So I think that if you add to this the very idea of the purpose of production, so it's not about producing commodities but producing commons, it is a pretty helpful to use digital distributed, not decentralized, this is different, distributed infrastructures, peer-to-peer -peer infrastructures to produce commons at large scale. And this is something I don't see in any other discourse movement. So how would you produce a tractor yeah. in a deep growth movement, right? Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. That's, that, that, that's where I see the helpfulness, but I, that's why I use this example. I have more in common with the degrowers standing on these pillars than with a, say, digital commoner standing on the pillars of market, um, of uh, anarcho-capitalism. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Stella, a question about knowledge diversity. So I think there are two, at least two ways to do it, probably many ways to do it. Uh, one is in actual practice. So if you, I don't know if you remember some of the examples that I gave in the morning, but the w maybe one that I can take right now is the uh, de the, the, the localized uh, governance of uh, water in water stress <coughs> regions in Western India, where uh, what they've done over the last 10, 15 years is to combine the traditional knowledge of uh, <coughs> water systems you know, rainfall patterns and groundwater and so on, with uh, hydrology using uh, GIS or GPS or whatever, you know, sort of computer technologies, um, and a whole a, a whole bunch of uh, young people from the villages have become what they call para geo hydrologists. Okay, there's a local term for it, which is even more complicated. So I'm not doing that. But this, so these are people who are, so what that means is that every village where these people are working is no longer dependent on an outside engineering engineer or hydrologist coming and working. Uh, but they are also having to change from being just their own traditional knowledge into this combined integrated kind of thing because situations have changed, climate change, and there are many challenges that they're facing now which they were not in the, in the past. I mean, the vegetation system may have changed, etc. So hydrological systems have also changed. Um, so I and this is there are many examples of this kind, and I think uh, so. These are examples where you actually begin to already see a more respectful relationship between two forms of knowledge with relation to ship to water. 
Conceptually, how do you change it? Uh, I think the biggest thing that has happened is that the modern knowledge system has displaced and discredited the other forms of knowledge. Okay? And uh, how do you bring that back? So I've been challenging universities in India, for instance, to say, why do you only have PhDs who are teaching these students? Why don't you actually have a, a traditional healer who's as much of a quote-unquote expert to come and also teach? Yeah, why don't you get a, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember the example of Menha Lekha, which is this village which has said that in our village we are the government. You get Devaji Tofa, who is sort of one of the local leaders, young leaders there. Ask him to come and actually talk to the students and he becomes a political science teacher without having a political science degree, right? What that does is two things. Number one, it tells students that knowledge is not only what's in the formal modern sector, one, and it creates respect there. Secondly, <coughs> it actually gives back some pride over their own knowledge to local communities, which has otherwise been so badly battered and bruised that they themselves, when we go to the village, say, oh, you people know much more than I do. They'll tell me, you know more than I do, which is ridiculous. I don't know more than they do, at least not for that local situation or for many other things. I, I can't farm for nuts, you know, I mean, I, I don't know what's in a forest. So I think it, uh, one needs to change things in these ways. And it's beginning to happen. In India, it's still initial. I don't know, in other places, maybe more is happening. So that's on knowledge. Um, on uh, no public recognition of time banking. Yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, more networking amongst the initiatives that are doing this kind of thing, but also the ability to actually sympathetically document an initiative like this and tell the rest of the world that it's happening. That's how we're trying to do it in India, where like there are thousands of invisible, invisible, okay, they're visible for the people who are doing it, but they're invisible for everybody else, uh, is to sensitively ask, so to do participatory sensitive documentation. It could be videos, it could be photo stories, it could be articles, whatever form they want, audio. And, uh, and of course, only if they agree. They may not want to be visible, but of course, if they want. And then spread that. And people sort of look at that and sit up and say, oh, wow, I didn't know that's happening. They might get inspired to try something on their own you know, or go and learn from this. So I would say that however small the initiative might be, it's worth putting into this networking and wider uh, outreach in order for others to be inspired by it. And then for you yourself to maybe expand it or to learn from others to do things better, whatever. So in today's world, it's very possible. It's not so difficult to actually get people to know what you're doing. So I have a quick response on simple living, but let me stop right now and then I can move. Um, <clears throat> one thing I would like to add, I don't know if I understood your question correctly, but maybe that refers back to what you said earlier also, like what could this project bring and what does it bring to us if we all share a common umbrella or anything like that? So um, I think after the degrowth conference in Leipzig, we tended to think so, oh, maybe all those people who came here, they really like the degrowth idea, and maybe that's really a common umbrella they would like to share. So that's also why the, I don't reason we did this project. But if you go into the details, it's more like people think they could assemble under the degrowth umbrella, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they think it's the best way to move forward, right? There you have to dig a lot deeper. So I think it's actually good to bring people together, initiatives together, and make them think about strategies um, to work together, common aspects, etc. But what that brings, we still have to see. And that's also part of the project, right? So we did not know where this project would lead when we started out, because we did not know the text. And then like, this grew up to 30 texts. None of us has read all of them so far. Um, so what we will bring together the authors again, and like also obviously workshops like that, where you relate those ideas, bring us forward and thinking, what, what, where can we go from there? But I guess it's a longer process than just the writing. Okay, yeah. okay well, let's take a couple of other questions. I'm really sorry, I'm, as I said before, we probably won't be able to take all of them. So maybe some in the back and then the third round here on the right. Yeah, hmm. five <laughs> questions. Okay, well, you all, Danny, yeah, maybe from here, from the back, from our uh, discussion. Um, what would be very interesting to us is to see also the differences between these movements, in the sense that the language that we use uh, always mirrors our political heritage, right? So let's say, for example, uh, the 
Messina, have you ever uh, needed the common in discourse in your um, in your meetings, in your struggles, in your ball selections, etc., or through the common in, uh, through through or to read common lands or spaces or practices? Have you maybe used also the language of uh, reclaiming social sovereignty and uh, what kind of alliances have you uh, have you needed? And where the differences then you find out? So. Um, yeah, the, the invitation is to go more in depth, uh, also into the differences. And uh, yeah, I think that's good. You too? You next to the other, yeah, one of you? Okay. Um, yeah, <coughs> I think it's a. Uh, I'll give you a name. There is a. Your name and. Ah, and uh, sorry. And my name is Sevillan, yeah, from Venezuela. Uh, yeah, I think it's a. Uh, yeah, I, well, uh, I come from. Uh, Computer right now is a, is a chaos, not a mess. And this is interesting for thinking about the, the road and commons, no? And uh, I think it's uh, uh, we in the country have made this debate, so it's really contradictory space for this debate, no? But um, we think, it, uh, I, well, I think it's, uh, it's important to put these discussions from in a specific context, historical or a uh, uh, what's, uh, what, what is the context in Latin America, for example, for think in, this, uh, in these topics? No? And I think it's maybe we, we are um, uh, constrained to think in this, not the top to, to down or to bottom, from its from Yeah, because it, I think it's a, it's a dilemma if we put the attention in construct. Uh, it's a, for me, I think it's a hard dilemma to put the attention in the construct of a universal language or how can we construct or produce the common in the territory in this moment. Because maybe we have, you have priorities because the context put you some priorities. No? Mm -hmm. And how can we uh, produce the commons in the territory and even not only for an imaginary uh, utopian future. You, maybe you have this priority for surviving, no? Because it's a different uh, context. So, how can we think in this concept <coughs> or, or commons in the from the context? And after uh, I put it, how can we think this is strate strategically, not romanticized? For example, how is how would be yeah, yeah how would be the relation between commons and public? Uh, what's what's the main of, of between the, the common and the public uh, sector or uh, scopes, for example, mm -hmm. no? what's uh, what's the the role of a uh, state in a in a south in a south uh, global south country, for mm -hmm. example? What is the relation between uh, our, us and the money, for example? This is a huge huge uh, uh, challenge, no? And what is the the relation with the commons and the uh, cultural structure in our countries? How is the how are the possibilities of the common in different countries? No? And the last is, <laughs> what are our political, main political obstacles for common? But it was because are even uh, related with violence, for example. So okay. I think that I am the most uh, think this in strategically and in the context. And okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That's one thing, I really like it if you share long comments, but you also have a time issue, right? So me, please be precise on your questions, and I think you can fill out a whole conference with your interesting okay. questions. <laughs> Lady next to him. Thank you, my name's Maddie, I live in the UK. I'm just interested in issues around breaking down the sort of access and breaking down social divisions and how in the specific initiatives related <coughs> to degrowth or commoning, um, you get a wider diversity of people in, involved in those things. And I think it goes a little bit back to this kind of question of when things are about survival in the Global South or coming from a different perspective of wanting to change things in the Global North, then the Global South quite often these are strategies which are brought in to uh, benefit people who are really very, already very marginalised. And in the Global North, quite often it's people who are coming from very privileged positions, including within their own societies, who get involved in trying to make that paradigm shift happen. So, as someone based in the Global North, I'm particularly interested in how you create, through these initiatives and through these approaches, wider social access. When I think about the Free University Project in my town, which is about saying that anyone can come and teach to other people, still most of the people who are going to come and do that teaching are going to be quite privileged people in that society. 
Um, so how do you change this? Thank you. Ms. Hamilton, yeah. Uh, you? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I'm Julien uh, from mainland uh, France uh, and um, fairly active in free software movement, but also, and this is where my question will be, uh, this year, for example, in France, we had a very long uh, strike movement against the reform of the uh, labor code, uh, main reform, um, and police violence and such. And in France, and uh, some other countries in West Europe, the traditional left, let's say, the Marxist, communists, and such, is still very strong in the civil society. Yet, at the same time, I have noticed that it is very difficult, I mean, it's kind of like as if it was two different worlds, the degrees <coughs> and such world, and this traditional Marxist world and such. And the, I was actually a little surprised not to hear much about trade unions, strike movements and such. I wanted to ask if this, there was a, like a profound uh, reason for this, like reasons why they are not completely allies, which is possible. Or if it is for uh, because the, the alliance and the bridges haven't be, been built yet, and if so, how do we build them? Um, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And you? Okay, I'm Elizabeth. Um, my question or statement goes in the direction of Silke. Um, uh, it's about the comments. If I understood you right, um, <coughs> your idea of the comments is uh, connected with the way to look on the world. So that comments means something like um, our world is um, basically awesome. relational. Yeah. So, um, and I guess you think that this is the right way to look um, on the world. And um, next, you said something like um, we should we shouldn't use um, like Microsoft or Apple. So you think, even though so you think this is the right way the world works, you think it's possible to like um, live or act in a way which is not relational, not common, or, or would you say it's just the wrong way to, or is there a right or and the wrong way to um, act a relational? Sure, uh, no, not to me, sorry. If, um, if the world view is something like the world's relational, so and this is the right way to um, how the world works, then it's basically not possible to um, act or live in a different way. So do that anyway uh -huh. uh, to live relational. Uh -huh. But within that, there seems to be right and wrong, wrong ways to do that. I'll try, yeah, I'll, try to, I'll try to respond. The first not yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry, no, yeah. they can yeah. have it. Just For me, the okay. question is like, what do we do with the people who are non, uh, who are non relational? What do we do with the people who like still don't want to go into this direction? Uh, yeah. No, they can't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, they can't sorry. Um, please be concise in your answers to not leave the people on the right completely out. And as you can already, already tell, it's, okay. yeah, it's five to four. So we'll go over time, but we started a little late also. Sorry, and thanks all for your interest with the question. Yeah, let me start. Okay, I, st I start with your question about, uh, do we use the word commoning? Um, okay, uh, yes, we do. We, we relate to common, we, we have, and I did not tell this because, okay, time is always short, but we have this, and who is interested uh, can come to me afterwards. We have this Nia Leni movement. Nia Leni is the name of a woman in Mali, the, but this is, this is also the name of the movement. It's a broader movement, not only the farmers' movements, but also uh, urban movements and, and so on, and, and women's movements and, and, and uh, scientists and so on, and trade unions. And, and, and this, the, this movement exists on a global level. And in, uh, in October, we have the second European Forum. We had the first in 2011. And there we had, and we organize uh, our conferences are for in a totally different manner. We have, for example, we have quota system, so we make sure, and this is also a little bit relating to your questions, that uh, we have uh, the different actors in our society, they have to be there. So we want uh, trade unions to be there, we want uh, marginalized people, there. we want people from the uh, poor. Uh, Against uh, movements against poverty to be there, and I, I'm sorry, but I haven't not seen any migrant person here yet. We want them to be there, so we we, we, we try to include them. So we we have quota systems, and we have when we work consistently on <coughs> different axes, and one of these axes is uh, regaining our resources and reclaiming our commons. So this is one of our central focuses uh, of the fraternity movement. And, and, and for me, this is, uh, okay, this is also trying to answer your question. I think we, it's not, uh, if we just say, uh, 
We have a free university that everyone can come. We have a free European social forum and anyone can come. Or we have a degrowth conference that people can apply. And we have different, uh, mem uh, uh, different fees to participate. We, we will not make sure that uh, all the people are here, which whom we have to work together to change the society. Mm -hmm. So we need to, uh, to also think about our methodologies and, our, uh, and the way we work together and the, also the, the way we uh, share our strategies and we also need to think about our language. Uh, and yeah, uh, very often when I'm invited to be in some conferences, it's always nice to ask Via Campesina because Via Campesina this is like the, the people from the bases, you know, the farmers, from the, they have their feet on the ground. And very often, um, I've studied at a university as well and I can write some articles, but very often I think about the people who are in our board, the intelligent people, farm, farmers, men and women, and they are our bo bosses, my bosses, for example. And I think, them, I, I think of them being in meetings, also in meetings like this here, and they will just go out and say that we don't understand and we don't want to come here never again. And then we are not going to change the world if we don't think about uh, the way we um, work together. Yeah. <coughs> oh, quickly. Um, first of all, to you, Daniela, an anecdote. I've done a Commons, I a Commons talk at the World Social Forum in Dakar a few years ago, and there were these um, academic white uh, people, many of them parliamentarians, and they were all saying, oh, but, 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 this cannot work, but it was a big but. And at the end, there was a really black, I guess, a guy from Ghana standing up saying, I want to thank you. It is the first time I heard talking somebody with an idea and a concept that actually describes what we are doing. So the comments is very empirical. It's not trying to impose a concept to other people. It's, we try to just to, I mean, I can only talk about comments if commenting is there. And the only the, the only but I have towards the language of comments and commenting is I cannot translate it into my language. It's really kind of really hard to do this. <laughs> One of the uh, most, the experiences I most learned from is precisely from Venezuela. It is a large scale thing for 40 years. It's called Secrecy Sola. And they are doing this. They have kind of, they are trying to gain sovereignty about the way they bury their people, about organizing local transport, about producing food, about health system, etc. in the context of Venezuela. I mean, just think about this. There's, it's a kind of, there's no other way out than this. What, um, so we need to think about commons public partnerships. Everybody knows about commons private partnerships. And what, what would you think about if you would come up with the term kind of commons public partnership? How, what would that look like? Why don't we invest more political and research energy in figuring out how this looks like and learning from the good examples? Last thing, uh, no, two, two more things. One on unions and one, one is what is the biggest obstacle? I think that the biggest obstacle is that we, including me, are trained to work on a basis on equivalence exchange. First, comparing us to each other, starting at school, I get a better qualification than you got. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and, and going to the supermarket, money versus commodity, money versus commodity. It's kind of, we are, we have the habit to be homo economicus, each of us. So this is, unlearn this and learn to comment is the most uh, important obstacle and has a lot to do with the educational system. And the last point on the unions. I had a discussion with um, a guy from, the, from Verdi, precisely from the unions, and he was really open to listen to me. The room was packed at the university in Uniborg and 300 young people, and young people don't have so many problems to relate to this discourse. And he was from a union ki kind of uh, a boss thing. And, and then he said, honestly, if you were right, we wouldn't need to exist anymore. And I think this is one of the main reasons. They, they fight in the old framework, production here and reproduction there. It's a quick one on unions also. I think when we're looking at workers and labor, it's not just industrial unions, actually the vast majority of 
workers, labor, are farm workers, fisher workers, uh, forest workers, etc. At least in our part of the world. <coughs> and we find that uh, actually alliances with, uh, with organizations of these workers, uh, peasant of course, is uh, actually much more, much easier or much less difficult between, let's say, the environmental organizations or the, you know, the sort of human rights organizations and these. Then with the industrial workers, there's been a, at least again in South Asia, there's been a sort of traditional distrust uh, that has built up for, for legitimate reasons. Environmentalists have never considered the rights of industrial workers. Industrial workers have never been in an environment in which environmental issues are important, etc. And I think that's a big, 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 big one that we have to actually try and work through. Uh, quick one on political obstacles to commoning. Uh, so there's always the, all the political obstacles of, of the state and corporations and so on. But that's fine. But I think no, the other one, no, no, fine. As in that's 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 what we all understand. Yeah. So I don't think we need to discuss it. No, I didn't mean fine in the sense that that's just horrible. We need to fight that. Uh, no, but I think the one that's in some sense is more difficult is the privatization that's happened of the mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether that's a privatization of knowledge or the the mindset that I, me, mine is the most important thing. It's my house, my land, my whatever. <coughs> and so actually recommoning, for instance, agricultural land, which this village that I spoke about in the morning has done, is an incredible step. It's a very, it took them 20 years of discussion to do it. Yeah. Uh, now imagine trying to actually convince the US, uh, citizens of America that private has to become common. It's a huge struggle. To me, that's a huge political obstacle. Just being able to figure out the mind. I mean, or even things like, well, why should everybody have a washing machine? Why can't the building have one single common machine which everybody can use, which is beginning to happen in some parts of Europe, I hear. Or, you know, all kinds of other things. I mean, why do we need our own personal X, Y, Z, when in fact you can have one that can be shared by 50 families or 100 families? That's a mental, that's a huge mind shift that has to happen. Um, yeah, it's four o'clock now, so in order to avoid that all of you leave minute by minute, maybe I'll announce now that we take 10 to 15 minutes more, and who is like completely done, and wants to leave earlier, maybe you leave now. I don't mind at all, just if people drop out, it's going to be a hazardous discussion, and maybe it's good for you to know it's completely okay if you leave. <laughs> Sorry for taking too much time. I'm Luigi from Italy. Um, wondering uh, if there is any factors. Close the door. Please close the door. We can't let them in. Wondering if there is any fact uh, that you have seen uh, uh, in India or uh, in Germany, in, in for this uh, link of associations in terms of governance. I mean, in terms of the issue to have uh, a counterpart versus the bodies that have the political power, that have the financial and economic power. So to have a, a set of associations that have a single interface can give much more an effective <coughs> way of managing the, you know, the, 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 you know, the traffic on, on, on points instead of a single small association spread on the territory that have less representative. So what is your experience in this field? I'm Jeremy from Italy, I'm a PhD in anthropology a doctor, and also an activist in, in, in the movement of the Crescita Felice. And to comment, I like it very much the drawing of uh, Filke, and I think also uh, from our experience, we, we did a network with um, an association in the health field, and what has been a winning choice is, the, I think, a, a humble approach with, with the growth. Just a uh, step back, maybe uh, we have renounced to, to put degrowth in the, our statement, in our basement, but we agree on the, on the statement. And, uh, and we do not put an umbrella, that is something that could be violent, but we propose a frame. But uh, it's one of the frame that uh, the association can take their other, other frame. That is one point. The other point, I think that uh, in order to propose more and more this frame, we have to think uh, uh, not only of who we are, but uh, how to build this movement on the territory. How to, there are a lot of people that read a book of the growth and they say, wonderful, but now what they can do? I can, I, how can I meet people like me that want to 
collaborate to share this kind of uh, thinking. So we, we, we have to organize ourselves and I think that this conference could be also a place for this kind of activism to, to help to, jo to join the bridges between uh, research and action and to do something on the ground. Okay, I would take those are the two last questions. Are there urgent questions you still have to ask? Okay, you and you. No, no, no. Not you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to hear from yeah. I'm interested, and take your name. Oh, sorry, yeah. Christabel, I'm from the UK and I'm doing research on food sovereignty. Um, I'm interested to hear from any one of you that wants to say something on it about, um, because you all mentioned language and getting away from terminology, um, but I wondered what you think about framing these movements within the language of rights, because I think there are pros and cons. And in uh, food sovereignty, it is framed in the, in the language of rights, which somehow fixes um, the call, which, which is kind of like a rallying cry that people can get behind. And it has come to be a big movement. But um, on the other hand, movements which have framed um, with the, the movement in the rights language have been co-opted somehow by institutions or government. So I wondered what you think about that, especially also bringing uh, like north south divides together in a universal kind of way. And then I can back. Hi, I'm Siri from uh, Lund University. There was a point brought up earlier about the, uh, I think uh, Ermi was saying about the, uh, the struggle that for being on the scene of the modes of production. I was hoping you could elaborate on that um, because it seems from some of the discussions earlier, we were really talking, uh, especially when we looked at the rural struggles and when we were looking at uh, the means of production, you know, so the, the most seems to have introduced a bit more instrumentalization that looks like it could reinvent it right back into the capitalist system quite easily. So if we're talking about the means of production, we, we usually clarify our terms of our territory or our common points of reference are. So I was hoping you could uh, help clarify what you meant by that uh, so that we could, could understand better what you meant. Yeah, who wants to start? I can start with, with that one, which I find extremely important and intriguing. Um, I guess if I would add a next, another point to the specific specificities of the comments, I would say that it's not a rights-based approach, precisely, and that's for a reason. Um, and it is, it is that the, if you want to link it to a rights framework, then you will need to look at the pillars this right, fra right framework is, is, is standing upon. So we could connect it to the third generation of human rights, that would be possible, I think. Where, again, the subject is not the isolated self, and the rights are to be delivered, so to say, from the state. So this is a kind of a liberal rights framework we cannot really work with, because it kind of deconnects us. Um, and this brings me to the point that, um, talking about sovereignty in a nation-based framework. When we talk about that, for you it must be extremely hard to talk about sovereignty because if, it's the, if you say sovereignty, people understand, oh, the sovereignty of the citizen of Germany or the sovereignty of the citizen of Mexico. And it's not what you're talking about. So I, uh, I kind of am obsessed right now with inventing new words because the old words don't work anymore. If you say work in the comments, we don't mean having a job. That's not, so we need to find new words. And about, um, I mean that, I mean that, oh. <laughs> just, just to quickly add on the rights thing, one is, the, so yeah, maybe a third generation which we're talking about collective rights, much more than human individual rights, which has been the case so far. But also, uh, all, to me, it's always important to put rights and responsibilities together. What I've said about Swaraj is really the freedoms and the rights, but with the responsibility towards respecting others' freedoms and others' rights, and that's not uh, that's not been prominent enough in the in the rights struggles very often. Um, on the on Luigi's question, the link of uh, so in, in in India, one of the uh, most common uh, things that we talk about is non-party political process. Uh, which is to say that civil society or movements, mass movements and so on, are saying that we don't necessarily want to capture the state. We don't necessarily want to form political parties that will contest elections. We want to make sure that power is with the people 
and in such a way that we also force those who are in power to be accountable to us. But we also do, so that's what I meant by radical democracy. So I think, and, and in India there's more and more of the linkages of this non-party political process that, are, that is taking place through many, I mean, for instance, National Alliance of People's Movements and many others, the Vikal Sangam process, where we're trying to actually see uh, that the ultimate aim of what we're doing is not to become the state, not to capture state power. And I think that's a big mistake that a lot of social movements in the past have made, including in India, you know, movements against whatever have been now formed political parties, and now we see the problems that they are having internally and that they're creating for, for people. There's always a distancing that happens when you actually become a political party which is in power. So I would say that, yeah, that we need, to, some of it is happening, much more is needed. Okay. Uh First of all, on the modes or means of, of production, we can also talk about different models of production. Uh, I, I, uh, it, it, of course, we have to talk about the means of production, but we also have to talk about uh, uh, the models which are behind them. You can call them modes or models if you don't like the word, the word mode because of its historical context. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's, it's um, as, as Silke told us in the comments, it has so many different, uh, to produce something, there are so many different aspects. You have the, the physical, you have the relational, you have the, uh, you have the, uh, the process uh, aspects. So in the end, we have to talk about all these if we talk about uh, of the battle of the different models of production, because they, they are all included. And we don't only ask, uh, who produces and how and what for, but also under which conditions uh, and and why? Uh, and this this uh, these these are the central questions we have to ask if we look at uh, at production and distribution. I think, uh, and I don't agree with with your that you say we have to invent new words. I remember one one uh, person from Attack Austria. He told us once in a in a meeting. You have to find a new narrative because food sovereignty is not sexy. You know, say sovereignty. It is who can, especially in German. I think it's different in Portuguese and Spanish, maybe also in French. It has a little different no meaning. Little, uh, yeah. You feel different. I think talking with my friends of, of South America and, and other and, and so on. I think it's different. In, in Germany, there's really this long history of state and sovereignty of our nation. And, and that's why right-wing movements really like food sovereignty. <laughs> they like the word. Mm -hmm. They like, and they really, and they say we, and also, uh, I think many of you know Aldi or Hofer, the big supermarket chain. And uh, one of the guys who introduced uh, organic food into Hofer, Aldi in Austria, he did a lecture on food sovereignty last May in on a university in Austria, <coughs> and I was writing to the university that it's not possible. You know, it's that's, that's we are campesina, that's our our political framework, and he he he, wants, he does the opposite of it uh, with with our framework. It's they like it because it sounds it's it's good for mainstreaming, but I think we have to be defended, and yeah. we have to constantly. Uh, Fill it with our uh, our strategy, with our goals, with our theory, with our history and our our struggles, and defend it against people who try to use it from us. Uh, and and I agree with the rights and the responsibilities. Uh, we say duties or responsibilities, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but we we think that it's people can only. Uh, People are only able to, to be responsible if they have rights. Of course. So it's the other way around. It's it's a little bit more difficult. So first, we have to struggle for the rights, uh, the rights to have rights, as I said before, uh, in order to be responsible. And this is um, I agree with you. It's not the right of individuals. It's the rights of collectives. It's the rights of uh, of groups. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to say, because uh, in, uh, there were some questions before about uh, the, the, the mindset, you know, people, uh, consumerism and so on, and my property and, and, and homo economicus and so on. And I think where we have to really be careful is 
uh, that also in, in this context of discussions in the degrowth movement, uh, it's uh, also it becomes very uh, powerful in, in in political discussions to also to to, to use this mindset also in, in in terms of you are responsible to uh, save the world in order. You are responsible to use less resources. You are responsible to, to, to have a, a smaller ecological footprint. So to use this whole concept of individualism, of, 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 of seeing people as consumers, and as a consumer, I'm responsible to consume less. Or to not to consume at all. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. And I think this is really important that, that we, we are very cautious in this. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>